Welcome back. This is our second lecture in our series on power generation, operation, and control. This lecture will cover the characteristics of power generating units. Here we have a picture of a, a typical uh, coal-fired power plant, and you'll you'll notice that we have a we have a plume of smoke uh, coming from it. Power plants that use coal tend to have very very tall stack uh, smoke stack to put that plume up as far as they can up in the air. Uh, you have a lot of conveyor belts like this. Uh, what we're seeing down in here is probably as the coal piled up and then pushed onto the conveyor to get it into the plant. Uh, there's always uh, a lot of facilities uh, to, to move the coal around. Uh, if, it, if it's a power plant that's located in uh, very cold areas during the winter, they have to be literally be concerned about the amount of moisture in the coal because it can freeze, and then you have problems with it jamming and things like that. So in any event, this is, uh, but this is the most uh, the, the popular type of generation of all the different generation types in the U.S. anyway is coal-fired. Now here we have the the schematic of a, a what we call just a the basic boiler turbine generator. So we have a boiler. We we burn fuel, coal, gas, or oil coming into the boiler. Uh, produces steam, and there's a steam valve located right here. The steam valve uh, regulates the amount of steam going into the turbine. The turbine then turns a shaft, and the generator produces uh, power. Note that up to this point, we call it the gross amount of power from the from the power plant, and this is the net power coming out here because some of that power comes back into the plant to supply what are generally called auxiliaries, pumps, fans, grinding equipment if it's a coal plant, lots of auxiliary machinery that has to be running in order for this whole process to be operating. There's a breaker right here. When the plant is sitting idle, that breaker will be opened and all of these things will be st basically standing still. There'll be no steam being produced. And you want to start the plant up. You have to take energy from the power system down into the auxiliaries to start the fans, the pumps, and so on and so forth to get the boiler running, to pumping uh, uh, water into it and, and bringing coal and starting it to, to burn. And eventually that produces some steam and they let the steam go through the valve to start this turbine spinning very very slowly at first and they do this whole process of startup takes many many hours for a large steam uh, uh, plant like this uh, whenever there's a, a large blackout and these units lose power they lose uh, all power um, you have to be concerned, how am I going to be able to get auxiliary power? If I have hydro units, I can start them with no auxiliary power, and then I can use the hydro units to supply this, uh, this power into the auxiliaries and then bring these units online. But it takes many, many hours. Once they're online, this is spinning. We measure, uh, we measure the, the, f the phase angle and the frequency on this side, the phase angle and frequency on this side, and we match them. We match the, the vector of, of um, the voltage on one of the phases here to the, to the uh, vector of voltage over here, and we match the phase. And when the phase of both is lined up and they're not changing rapidly, we close the breaker. And now the unit can be the steam can come more into the turbine, it can come up to full full power output. But you can't simply just close the breaker when this hasn't been synchronized because that will damage the, uh, the unit by causing it to uh, suddenly try to lock into the power system. So it's very important to get the two f uh, in, in phase before we start the, uh, the, the generating plant going. Uh, we're going to talk a lot in the course of the input-output. This is basically, this, the input-output function is called H, and it's how much fuel input in terms of heat, energy, MBTU per hour comes in, and how much 
does power does that produce in megawatts output? So here's the megawatts down here on this scale. And uh, this, this scale, if we multiply by a fuel cost, could be a cost curve F of in dollars per hour with units of dollars per hour. And that'll be very important when we get to optimization and economically operating the system. We're going to talk a lot on the next uh, few slides about the slope of this input-output curve, delta H or delta F versus delta P. That slope is called the incremental, the incremental heat rate or the incremental cost rate characteristic. And often it's a, it's, a, it's a sloping curve, sometimes it's a straight line, and it's delta H over delta P. And that characteristic has units BTU per kilowatt hour. It's energy over energy. Okay, or if you're using cost rate, uh, it's dollars per kilowatt hour in here, right there. So these are the are the uh, the units of the incremental uh, uh, heat rate or incremental cost rate function. Uh, but there's another function called the net heat rate, where we take the H curve and divide every point. We divide every point on the H curve by the value of P. So now we have a we have a function. It, it's really how much fuel input or energy input in BTU versus electrical energy output kilowatt hours. If this were the the opposite uh, curve, if if the curve were were plotted uh, P over H. Um, it would it would be a function that peaked somewhere. We would say this is the maximum efficiency because we would be looking at output divided by input. That's the maximum efficiency. Well, we use heat rate, net heat rate, um, and we try to operate the plant right here where uh, we we use the least amount of uh, input to get this uh, to get a certain kilowatt hours out of the plant. And we often use the net heat rate um, for ranking these these uh, generators versus each other uh, when we're trying to select which is the next unit to put online. Um, we often talk about approximate representations, especially for the incremental heat rate function. And oftentimes we just use straight line segments for that cost curve or that input output curve. If we use a series of straight line segments, then the derivatives, the slopes, are a series of steps like that. Uh, if we use a quadratic function, then we get a, a straight line like this for, for delta H over delta P. We will come back and talk a lot about this incremental heat rate and how to, how to uh, approximate the, that later on. Um, we're going to talk now about those steam valves. And if, if you start the unit at zero and you gradually open the first steam valve, you get up to this much output. But now it's completely open. Now we have another valve. And I'm going to exaggerate this. But you notice that it curves up and then it curves back down. Now the second valve has opened completely uh, uh, all the way. Now the third valve goes from closed to open. And you look at the, the way it curves up it curves and then it comes back down. These points here are called the valve points. And if you plot the incremental heat rate for this kind of generator with valve points, you have a, the, the initial one is, is a flat, that's a constant slope. But then the slopes do this. The slopes come very high, the slope here jumps, and then it comes back down, and it goes to a lower value. Then it jumps, and it comes back down. It jumps, and it comes back down. Um, optimizing the economics with uh, these kind of functions uh, can yield, uh, uh, I will say, seemingly extra savings, but you actually can't operate the power plant on these, uh, on these uh, valve points. So we'll talk more about the reasons for that later on. A common header plant simply says that we have a big box, if you will, or pipe. And we have multiple boilers um, over here that are feeding steam. They're all feeding steam into this common box, the common header. 
and then different pl different turbines are drawing steam off to operate their respective generators. Here we have a boiler that's steam going in at a high pressure here to this turbine and then at a lower pressure the steam is coming out and going in here where it'll be used again in another turbine at a lower pressure it's called a topping turbine. In this kind of power plant called a combined cycle we use gas. Not today the, the, the gas of, uh, is natural gas. It, it, it earlier times they used aircraft fuel because what we have here is, a, is an engine as, it, as er, in the early days it was like taking an aircraft um, engine, an aircraft jet engine, and on the same shaft you put a generator and then you put aircraft, uh, you pumped uh, aircraft grade fuel into it and air. The first thing it does is compress everything that compresses the air, mixes it with the fuel, it, it goes into an ignition chamber where it expands and comes out. Now in an airplane, it just comes out. There's a lot of heat going back out the, the, the back side of a, an aircraft engine. Well, they begin to scale these up. This is a, this engines now are much larger, but you, it, essentially it's, a, it's, a, it's the same kind of combustion turbine. Uh, it, it, in other words, we're not putting steam into it, we're putting the fuel directly into the turbine and it's burning inside the turbine and turning a generator. So that's what's in this building. And then you'll, you'll notice that, that here is a, is a building where we, we go up this, this slope like this. And this is typical. You can recognize the combined cycle plant by, by the fact that, that this thing, this is capturing all that heat coming out and it goes into a, a, a set of pipes that are located back here and those pipes contain water and the heat produces steam in those pipes which is then used in another turbine. So we'll see that on this, this next slide where we have, we actually are going to use four of these. So here comes gas into the, into the, to the combustion turbine or the gas turbine which is turning um, a generator, but then here's the waste heat. Now it's just hot gases coming out, going through what's called a heat recovery steam generator, HS, HRSG, heat recovery steam generator, and now we've got steam coming down over here, which goes into another turbine with another generator. Now here we had multiple uh, steam uh, combustion turbines feeding steam into uh, to this generator. Uh, what is often done is to take an old generating plant where they had a they had a boiler here, um, and then they then they took the boiler out and they installed these units up here, and they the steam from the heat recovery units goes into the to the older turbine generating unit to to generate uh, power, and it it results in a very efficient. Uh, use of the uh, the fuel. These are much more efficient than the standard boiler uh, turbine uh, uh, generating unit. Uh, this is a obviously a, a hydroelectric plant. This is the the plant on the Niagara River. This is the Niagara River. It's flowing this way, um, and you draw water from above Niagara Falls through some large pipes, large conduits, to a a big What's, what's called the, 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 the forebay back here, which is uh, very deep, and they fill that with water, and they keep water flowing into there, and then the water comes down through here, and the hydro turbines are here, and then the water comes out into the river and flows. And this, is, of course, is the Niagara River connects Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, uh, and is the border, the border of the U.S. and Canada, runs right up the middle of the river. Uh, from this side, you can see a little bit of it. There's another plant. It's not identical uh, in, in architecture and, and so forth, but it's roughly the same size. The Ceratomec power plants on the Canadian side, Robert Moses uh, power plant on the Niagara Falls side, 2,000 megawatts. So hydro plants are, um, are often very, very, very large. Um, we have them out in the, the western U.S. Uh, up to about 6,000, 9,000. Uh, there's one in South America at Itaipu uh, between Brazil and Paraguay on the Parana River. 
20,000 megawatts. So hydroelectric is often the first form of electricity that's brought into uh, existence in uh, developing countries uh, because it, it, it solves several problems. It, it may solve flooding problems. It, it helps the, the river to become navigable, although this the, the Niagara River here is not navigable. Uh, uh, there's there's a, uh, a canal that was dug uh, many miles away that uh, parallels the Niagara River if they want to bring ships uh, from from the ocean uh, through the Great Lakes, but they don't they don't navigate the Niagara River. But in any event, many big rivers can become navigable simply because it it uh, tames the water and they generate electricity. So it's often the very first uh, form of electricity, and it's once it's in, you don't have to pay for the fuel, which makes it um, economical. Here's the um, the, the, the impoundment here, here's the four bay where there's, this is all water out, out here in this reservoir. And the idea is there would be a valve that we would open here at the top of this and we'd let water come down. Now the water is moving and so it's gone from potential energy into kinetic energy. It goes through this, this, uh, this turbine here and it turns the shaft. Notice that the shaft of the generator is vertical and it's turning like this. It turns much slower than the shaft of a steam turbine or gas turbine where it could be turning 1800 or 3600 RPM. These are only turning typically a few hundred RPM and it's done that way by putting many more poles inside this generator that's that's turning here. You might have 24 pole or something motor uh, and windings in, inside here, but it still produces in the U.S. 60 hertz energy or other parts of the world 50 hertz um, energy. The water then comes after the turbine, it comes down out here into what's called the after bay. A uh, very typical diagram, and it, we're very concerned with, with how far down uh, does the water actually uh, fall. Uh, we can draw input-output uh, curves. Notice here we use, we use a, a very interesting, in the U.S. anyway, uh, unit that's an acre. An acre is 200 feet by 200 feet by one foot. It's a, it's a cubic measure of water. Um, many parts of the world they use cubic meters, uh, uh, but we use these acre feet. Uh, and so how many acre feet of water per hour uh, will give us how much power output? And it's roughly linear all the way up to right about in here. And now there, there are cavitation effects and other nonlinearities that come in and cause cause us to have to put more and more water through to get that next increment of power. Uh, out of the unit. So uh, another effect that we that uh, well we we take derivatives of we call it the incremental water rate so it's acre feet per kilowatt hour roughly a constant until we hit that in linearity and then the then the slope goes up constantly like this so that's dq uh, dp for the uh, hydro plant and we'll 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 be using these curves uh, when we're doing the scheduling of the hydro plants. Uh, the input-output curves for the hydroelectric plant with what we call a variable head. So if I, if I take a certain volume of water, and I assume it's, it's uh, like this, if my, after the, 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 the reservoir is 400 feet deep, I get that much power, but if, if it's 450, if it's additional 50 feet more, I might get this much power. If it's 495, I get more power. So I like to, to, to operate the plant when the, when the water level is very high behind the plant. And so this curve literally has another parameter, which is the, the head, the net head behind the, the water. And so for the same volume of water, if it's dropping further, it's going to pick up more energy so we get more power out of the plant. This is another type of, of generator known as a pumped storage. The idea being that I will use energy during high price periods of the day and I will pump water up 
and into a reservoir. Now this one is called Ludington and it is built on the shore of Lake Michigan. It's built in, it's in the state of Michigan. And the idea is that you, you force air into this um, pump generating unit down here and start it to spin. Then you let water come in and suddenly it's driving water uphill. It's pumping the water up into the reservoir. And you pump for uh, as long as you can until you fill this reservoir. And then later on, you, you come along and you reverse. You let the water come down from the reservoir and generate. So the idea is that you, if, if, for example, at night when energy is very abundant and the price goes way down, then we'll, we'll buy electric energy and we'll push water up into the upper reservoir. Then during the peak hours of the day when the price for energy is very high, we take that reservoir, the same water, and we bring it back down and generate with it. And if there's a great enough price differential, we will make money. Now, uh, this whole process of just pumping and then back uh, generating for the same amount of water you get back about 67 percent about two-thirds of the energy that you use to um, uh, in pumping is available for generating only two-thirds that's the, the, the relative efficiency of it uh, input output characteristics for a, a pump storage unit uh, we like to say that there's there's the pumping there, and in reality we don't vary the pumping. We don't we don't do much with this. We operate it right at a certain constant value for pumping, and we just pump until the, the reservoir is filled, or until we have to we have to stop pumping at a certain time. Uh, here's our standard. Uh, whenever we're generating, we can vary the uh, the, the power output. The, the power can be varied back and forth over this uh, range like this. Okay, another new type of, of generation that's come along over the last uh, uh, 20 years or so is called wind generation, where we have this, this wind generator like this. And I, I took this picture at a, at a wind plant in southern Minnesota, and uh, literally um, there's, a, there's a small circle around the base of the wind generator uh, and then there's a there's a road that comes in and they they rent the road space and this small circle of land from the farmer and the farmer can then still cultivate the rest of the field but this part is is being um, reserved for use of the power company and the farmer receives an income for every every uh, wind generator that's on the, on the farm and um, I, I want to encourage you, those of you that, that really want to get in to understand how these work, notice that, the, that the, 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 the speed of the blades can vary depending on the speed of the wind. And therefore, we cannot depend on the speed of the blades to provide a f constant frequency for the output energy from a wind generating unit. And the way that we have to do that is that we have varying speeds, but we have constant frequency. So it's not like operating a synchronous machine where the frequency and the speed are locked into each other. Here, the, the speed can vary over quite a range, but the frequency of the electrical energy coming out is 60 hertz in the U.S., 50 hertz other places. I encourage you to get into some of the power electronics courses to understand how this works. So here's the here's the uh, you, what we could call the input output uh, uh, diagram for a wind turbine. Uh, there's a certain speed below which we don't try to generate. At the cut-in speed, we start to let the blades rotate. The blades rotate as the speed goes from 3.5 to 14, and the output climbs up this curve like this. Relatively uh, nonlinear compared to uh, uh, let's say some of the other curves that we've been been talking about but at a certain point it's reaching the rated power output of the generator and then no matter what this what the speed is they adjust the blades uh, to just keep the, uh, the generator uh, uh, rotating and drawing that much power out of it until it reaches a, a cutout speed that's called 
where it's so fast, the rotation is so fast that it could it could damage the, the wind generator, in which case now they they rotate the blades so that they, they're not picking up energy from the wind and they literally let it go to zero and that's the way they handle it during a very high high wind, high high velocity uh, periods uh, for wind. One of the things that's um, interesting to think about a single wind generator the output goes up and down sometimes very radically up and down like this during the uh, during certain hours it gets faster and so that's because wind is not a constant phenomenon um, but if you take a large number of these we take a group of wind uh, generating uh, uh, plants and we put them together this 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 gets to be a lot smoother and and here we, we this is data for uh, German uh, uh, wind turbines in Germany. These are all the wind turbines in Germany, and you could you can you can look at it, and and you can then begin to plan and say, well, we we can plan on roughly this much area during this period of the day, and this much during another period of the day, and it tends to smooth out. You don't get this 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 high uh, variability when you have many many wind turbines operating together because certain places the wind will be will be blowing fast and other places it won't but it tends to average out uh, over a large geographic area the book has um, tables that go for for power plants from the size 50 megawatts all the way up to 1200 and this is basically uh, a heat rate BTU per kilowatt hour data from for our, uh, for units from from 100% it's maximum output down so so really each each unit's numbers are in the row like this and um, you'll you'll notice that 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 heat rate um, is is lowest near the top and then as you get back out it's going up remember that was a that was a curve that looked like that looked like this and oftentimes uh, we, we, it stops right at the, the best point. So in these cases, here's here's one where it, it actually came and it and it and it came down and it went up a little bit. There's you notice this point here that it uh, well no this is th th these are all smaller uh, when they get to the to the peak of the unit. Okay, and so that that gives you some idea of what these these. Uh, heat rates can be for large steam generating units. Here are the um, some numbers for nuclear gas turbines and then for various size uh, steam units just because this is this is the kind of thing you've got to worry about if you're if you're looking at the production cost. What are the maintenance? How many days a year is it down for maintenance? How often is it forced out? In other words, what percentage of the time is the plant operating and what percentage of the time is it down for some sort of maintenance? If you think about your automobile, your automobile is not 100% availability. Sometimes it's in the garage having minor repairs or major repairs. Um, and you would like it to be 100%. Well, so would the operators of the power plants uh, like to have that be 100%. But it varies all the way from... 72 up into the 80s, 94 gas turbine units. Um, our last slide here talks about fuel price, the price of fuel, and we have a, 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 a figure from um, the Department of Energy in the U.S. Now this is some yearly prices up to uh, 2001, and then we go all the way up to 2006 and um, notice the um, the variability that we go from about three dollars per MBTU. And by the way, I use this is the way they express it. You will see MM BTU, but it's the same as as if I had written MBTU. In, in the book, uh, we we use MBTU. And it just means 10 to the 6 BTU. And so this would be 1,000, 1,000. But it means the same thing. Uh, uh, and I want, want to make sure that, that, that that's clear. So it goes from about $3 per MBTU all the way up to, to 11.5 or almost 12. Factor of 4, the price of natural gas over, over this period, which is about a 5-year period. Gas, natural gas is 
has often had a, a fairly volatile price. So does petroleum. Um, but we, when we look down here, um, we want to notice the fright. The price of coal. Here's the price of coal. Um, it hasn't changed that much. It hasn't changed that much. It hasn't even uh, gone through a multiple. So the price of coal, coal tends to be contracted for for long periods of time. And its price is very economical compared to some of these other fuels. So thank you. We hope that um, you have enjoyed this lecture. And we look, f we look forward um, to seeing you on our next lecture. Thank you.